To have a glacial cycle, you first have to be in an ice age. For unknown reasons, the Earth has been cooling for the last 50 million years, and 34 million years ago, we entered an ice age when Antarctica froze over. The cooling has continued, and 5 million years ago, the ice age became bipolar when Greenland froze over. With two of the Earth's largest continents reaching into the Arctic, the climate became extremely sensitive to small variations in the Earth's orbit caused by the gravity of the Sun, Moon and planets. The glacial cycle then appeared. Most of the time, the northern part of Eurasia and North America is covered by huge ice sheets. By short interglacials occur when the ice sheets melt. This was discovered 200 years ago, and the first seriously considered theory was proposed by Svante Arrhenius when he said around 1900 that glaciations could be caused by changes in CO2. 20 years later, Milutin Milankovic proposed that they were due to changes in the orbit, which he calculated with pencil and paper. For Milankovic, conditions during the Northern Hemisphere summers were important in determining glaciations. Short cold summers caused glaciations and long warm summers caused interglacials. Milankovic's theory was soon discarded, but in 1976, to everyone's surprise, it was discovered that glaciations did indeed follow Milankovic's orbital frequencies, proving that scientific consensus is worthless in science. There are three types of orbital changes. Changes in the eccentricity of the orbit, which produce cycles of 405, 125, and 95,000 years. Changes in the inclination of the axis, which produce cycles of 41,000 years, and changes in the precession of the orbit and axis, which together produce cycles of 19, 22, and 24,000 years. There is some confusion about which of these changes is the most important in determining the frequency of interglacials. In this figure, we show that changes in northern hemisphere summer insulation and temperature changes over the last 400 years. Most researchers believe that it is eccentricity that produces a 100,000 year cycle. The problem is that eccentricity produces very small changes in northern hemisphere summer insulation. The cause and effect is not linear. Others think it is precession, but we have two problems. One is that precession has too many cycles, and the other is that climate shows little response to changes in precession. Again, the cause and effect is not linear. Only changes in the tilt of the axis show a climate response proportional to the changes in insulation it produces. But obliquity also shows more cycles than it should. How do we resolve this? I measure the temporal distance between the start of each interglacial and the next for the last 800,000 years. And the result is that with small irregularities, it reflects multiples of 41,000 years, the frequency of obliquity. The 100,000 year cycle is nowhere to be seen. How do the small changes in axis tilt produce the massive changes in ice volume that accompany the glacial cycle? Scientists have not yet been able to answer this question. Keep in mind that global annual insulation does not change, only seasonal insulation. And to make matters worse, the hemispheres change in opposite ways. In this figure, I saw in red the change in insulation for the month of July at 60 degrees north. Now we see in blue that the opposite happens at 60 degrees south. It is not the ideal situation to change the climate of the whole planet. Below we have the changes in the tilt of the axis. But let's also look at the changes in insulation at a lower latitude, 30 degrees north. Obviously they are not the same. Sometimes the curves are further apart and sometimes they are closer together. Now let's look at the difference in insulation between 60 degrees north and 30 degrees north. This shows us the changes in the insulation gradient between these two latitudes. And the changes in the insulation gradient in the northern hemisphere in summer coincide with the changes in the tilt of the axis. Let's repeat the process for the southern hemisphere and bingo, they now coincide. When the obliquity is high and the north pole faces the sun in summer, the insulation gradient is small, favoring an interglacial. When the obliquity is low, the insulation gradient in summer becomes larger, favoring glaciation. One of the big problems in explaining the glacial cycle is that the moisture to build the ice sheets must come from the tropics. 
but the tropics are hardly affected by orbital changes. The energy they receive is essentially the same. My hypothesis that changes in heat and moisture transport are capable of changing the climate and are a natural cause of climate change that has been ignored is capable of explaining how the ice sheets of the glacial cycle are built and destroyed by changes in the insulation gradient. It is primarily the insulation gradient that determines the amount of heat and moisture transported by creating a temperature gradient. The steeper the gradient, the more heat is transported. Transporting more heat to the pole makes the planet cooler because heat escapes more easily due to the fact that the greenhouse effect is much smaller in the polar regions due to the lack of water vapor in the cold atmosphere. Transporting more moisture increases the amount of snow and ice. How do we know this is true? Since the beginning of this century, the transport of heat and moisture to the Arctic has increased. So the Arctic has warmed, but at the same time, the summer snow cover in Greenland has increased. This result is difficult to explain unless it is seen as the result of a change in transport. What we see in this figure is the same thing that makes Milankovitch work. Our interglacial has at least 1000 years left. But the idea that we can stop the next glaciation by emitting CO2 will not work, I'm afraid. Thanks for your attention. If you like climate science and want to know more about it, you can buy my books, which are available at Amazon and other internet stores. You can also subscribe to my YouTube channel.